now, three weeks prior to this, been talking about guardrails. In case you have trouble remembering, you can always look at this and uh, just remember our series about guardrails. And we've been looking at, during this time, we've looked at what it means to have a guardrail in our life. Um, the definition, the, the definition of a, of a guardrail as far as vehicles are concerned is a, is a guardrail is a system designed to keep vehicles from straying that's been our key word, straying, into dangerous or off-limit areas. And uh, we don't, it's, it's an invisible part of our driving experience. And Chad, I forgot the video lead in again, so we'll get it sometime. <laughs> Last couple of weeks, we've had a video lead in, and I forgot to do it. Just jumped right in on it. But it, it, essentially, in our lives, guardrails are an invisible part of our driving experience. We don't generally go around saying, oh, look, there's a guardrail, or anything like that. You're going to notice it if you ever need one uh, because it may save you from just going off the cliff. We'll find guardrails in areas where there's sudden changes in our driving experience, curves, uh, things like that, where there's drop-offs on the other side. We'll find them where there are huge obstacles on the other side of that, all over a bridge or over a big cliff. If you've been out west in some of the Rocky Mountain states, you know that those guardrails are there, and you're really glad that they're there. Uh, we don't generally argue about where they put guardrails. Guardrails are actually not in the danger zone. They're in an area where you could possibly drive if you wanted to. But we don't argue the point. We don't say, I wish they'd move that guardrail so I could get three feet closer to the edge of the cliff. But in our, in our physical and spiritual walk, Sometimes we do that. We live our lives right on the edge. There's a big drop-off over here. There's a sudden, sudden thing that's going to happen, if we, and, and we straddle that. And, and, and we kind of walk the edge as far as danger zones in our spiritual walk. We've talked about this over the last few weeks, about what it looks like to have those guardrails. We've talked about it where, where our, our relationships, friend-wise, how the people that we hang out with affect us, where we're headed, where we're going. Because uh, when their lives blow up, it, it's the law of proximity. If you're close to them, when their life blows up, you might not be doing the same thing they're doing. You might not be participating in what they're doing. But when their life blows up, you blow up with them. Okay? If you weren't here, Chad would love to make you the uh, CD on that message. They're also on YouTube. Uh, just do a search for FWC Beaumont. Um, then last week we talked about how our... Our human desire for intimacy drives us sometimes to go over the cliff and how that in the area of sexual issues and intimacy that we need reinforced steel in those areas because here's the thing, God created male and female, created he them. So it wasn't like God made man and woman and all of a sudden it's like, <laughs> what have I done? He had the plan. He knew that that was the plan. The thing is that, that our society distorts that makes us, baits us right to the edge of destruction. So we need guardrails in those areas. And so our definition of a guardrail in this series is a personal standard of behavior that becomes a matter of conscience. It's a personal thing. Your guardrails may not look like my guardrails. Your guardrails may not be put in the same place as my guardrails. I know my weak areas. You know your weak areas. You know the areas where you need triple high reinforced steel. It might not be the same as mine, and I can't tell you exactly where to put them. You can't tell me exactly where I need them. It's the thing that you've got to work out in your own life with the Lord. But it's very, very possible that had we been introduced to this early in our life, that we could have possibly avoided the greatest regret in our lives. Some of us are thinking about things whenever I said the greatest regret in your life, things are flashing through your mind. And you wish that somebody had talked to you about a guardrail at one time in your life. Putting it up in a certain area. It might be the area of intimacy and sexual issues. It might be drugs and alcohol. It might be any number of things. It might be relationships, whatever it is. But you wish somebody had mentioned it to you. You wish that you'd had those things. And possibly if you'd have set those guardrails in your life early, that you would have possibly avoided the greatest regret in your life. So we've been looking at some of the wisdom. We've looked in Psalms, we've looked in Proverbs, we've looked at some of the things the Apostle Paul has shared. But in Proverbs 27, Solomon shares this, and he says, A prudent person 
foresees danger and takes precaution. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. The, the NIV reads this way. It says, The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. I won't ask for a show of hands. I don't think there's anybody in here that says, oh, I want to be the simpleton. <laughs> I want to just, I want to see what's going on. And I just want to keep going. And I want to pay the consequences in my life. No, 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 no. We want to be the wise person. We want to be the prudent person. We want to be the person that sees danger coming and, and does something about it before we take this dive off the cliff. We don't want to spend our whole life just skidding down the guardrails of life and watching the sparks fly. We want to be prepared. We want to be ready. We want to be that wise person. So that's what we've been looking at over the last few weeks. Um, as a part of today, and this is probably going to last today, maybe one more Sunday, but as a part of today, I, I shared with you when we first started this that there was going to be one in message in particular that I was going to get my wife to share some input with. This, that is today. So y'all give her a hand clap. And uh, she's going to... Well, hand it here so you don't have to lift it. So, we are going to sit down here and share some things with you. White microphone, Chad, for my wife. I got my phone, so don't think I'm texting, just so you know. He gave me an outline. Yeah. He said if I veer from the outline, I might not be invited back. <laughs> I just said I would in introduce her. Y'all enjoy the one and only time that my wife would get to come up here. But I'm, no, I'm just, we're just kidding. Here's the thing. <laughs> we, uh, we have... We have, in the last few weeks, shared some things, especially last week. How many of you here were for last week's message? Okay. Uh, if you weren't here, go and listen to it. We talked about some pretty heavy stuff last week as far as relationships are concerned, about how that there's a spiritual side uh, to an intimate relationship. Uh, we think it's all about sex, think it's all about the physical part, but there's a greater spiritual part involved in that right relationship. And so... Uh, I felt like we didn't have hardly enough time last week to talk about it all. And so I did want to share a couple of things. And uh, let me just preface this by saying we are not in any way putting ourselves out here as the poster children for the perfect relationship. Okay? Ours is just like yours. Amen? We're, we're, you know, we have our ins and outs. We've been together for 27 years now. And uh, it's, we've had some, especially the first few years, we've had some tough times. We've had some good times. But here's the thing, I think we can share some things that might help some of our couples and some of our marriages. And see, here's the thing, it was God's plan in the very beginning. Whenever he created man and woman and instituted marriage in the home, that was his plan for all the ages. Thousands of years before he introduced the church, his method of carrying out his plan on earth was through the marriage in the home. And so one of the things that, that I think our society today is degradating. I think the enemy comes against our marriages, comes against our homes, comes against our relationships in that manner because they know that the power of God is in that and that it was God's plan. So whenever, whenever that's undermined, whether it be in, in television or movies or those kind of things, I think it is nothing more than a plot and a plan of the enemy. So some of the things that I want to talk about today... Uh, if you weren't here last week, get the message from last week because I'm not going to review it. But I've had lots and lots and lots and lots of questions since last week. And one of the things was about the, the guidelines. Now remember, they were guidelines. Say guidelines. <laughs> they weren't Ten Commandments. They weren't written in stone. I told you it's just some, some ideas that I have about how I've worked life. Um, I don't want anybody, you know, I, I think some people thought I was given the Ten Commandments for, for relationships, and I wasn't. It was just some guidelines. But one of the things was that as far as setting guardrails and relationships, as far as married people not being alone with an with a unmarried person, okay? And uh, this is the way we've always done that. You may be, because of work or otherwise, you may be in a situation where you have to be 
in that situation. It might be going to a company meeting. It might be going to a conference. And all of a sudden, because of gas is high and you're riding in one vehicle, it's not like I'm going to say, oh, oh, my goodness, I can't believe you did that. Here's what you do. Communication is key. If I'm ever in that situation, and I have been in some situations, not necessarily riding in a vehicle, but I've been in situations where I was kind of uncomfortable. You know what I did? I pulled out my cell phone, and I called my wife, and I said, hey, uh, just checking in with you. I'm with, and we're it, and I just wanted you to know. Easy as that. And all of a sudden, if somebody said, hey, says to her, hey, I saw your husband with, and they were at, and what was that about? And she said, I don't know, but wait a minute. I'll be finding out. <laughs> I will be checking that out. Y'all don't know, she's got a good snap. No. <laughs> and she would be checking on that, just as I would if somebody told her about something. So what I'm telling you is communication is key. If you're ever in that situation, maybe you're forced to because of work situations. Uh, it's not that it's the end of the world. Communication is key. You tell her tell him whatever it is um as we talked about last week um there are there are some times if there's somebody at your work and, and whatever this is and they just get to you talk to somebody don't talk to your spouse about that talk to somebody guys talk to a friend of yours just you know try to try to avoid those situations where somebody's just there and they're they're available and they're getting to you um but basically, it comes down to this. Your spouse needs to know where your guardrails are. And they need to know, they need to be comfortable with where your guardrails are. Because sometimes maybe our guardrail in an area, a certain area, wouldn't be exactly where they'd like it to be. And that's where communication comes in. You want to jump in? Then? No? She's just up here for, for looks. <laughs> Helps me look. It makes me look worse, actually. <laughs> but anyway... Your spouse needs to know where your guardrails are and needs to be comfortable with where they are. Um, here's the thing. We've always talked about it. Your spouse, especially if you're doing the hiring and firing in a business, don't hire some pretty little thing to be your assistant because they need your help. Get them help. But it doesn't have to be your help. And... Let your spouse, if you're in that situation, you're in a hiring and firing position, be sure that your spouse is comfortable with who you hire. Don't go home after the fact and say, hey, I hired their, and here's their picture. <laughs> no, 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 that's not a good thing. Here's the thing. Work will eventually impact your home. Let your home impact your work. Let, let, it, let it have an influence on your work. And, and not bring your work home and have it blow your home up, all right? So enough said about that area. Anything you want to add in that? We know where our guardrails are. And here's the thing, realizing we're in a little different situation than a lot of people because I'm a pastor and she's a pastor's wife. But we live in a fishbowl. And that's one of the reasons why I go extraordinarily out of my way above and beyond what most people would or should. Uh, in avoiding this particular issue because all it would take uh, Satan would just love to blow what God's doing up and God's doing some good things so I go above and beyond as I shared with you last week I, had, I, I needed to meet with somebody there wasn't anybody that they could bring with them there wasn't anybody here at the church besides me I stood out under the carport and met with them I know at the time that they didn't understand that but I think they did after I explained it to them because I'm just not going to be put in that situation because all it would take is for one person to see that and all of a sudden the gossip train comes through and <laughs> it blows up. So, I'm about to leave the relationship part now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I did have something. Okay. Um, totally off that, kind of off that subject, but uh, Guardwell early on in our marriage, I remember we argued a lot when we first married and we... <laughs> Don't even go there. <laughs> we argued a lot, and um, I remember uh, we had two little things, and they were real simple, nothing biblical. We weren't even saved when we first married. But one was never go to bed angry, and we didn't, no matter. I mean, we, there's mornings we would stay up till 3 in the morning, but we always talked it out and worked it out and, you know, made up. That was the best part. <laughs> so <laughs> never go to bed angry. And the other was, I don't know why, but just 
I mean, early on in our marriage, we both decided, and this is a good guardrail, to never even mention the word divorce. It's, it's not even, even in our vocabulary at home. We've never threatened it. We, I mean, I won't say I haven't considered it, you know, in my mind. <laughs> We've never really considered divorce. Murder was an option. Murder, a yes, times, twice, yes. Just twice. But I've, we never <laughs> talked about it. It never came up in an argument. Even in the most heated moment, we never threw that word out there. It, we, it, uh -uh. It's not an option. No matter how ugly it gets, you know, to me, marriage is a great big wheel. And on this side, it, you know, you may be happy and joyous, and this is the best three years of my married life. I can't get enough of you. And the big wheel spins around, and, you know, you're over here in the next couple of years, and this season may be tough. You know, it would be easier to divorce sometimes, but that's not an option. You just hang on and hang on because the wheel will keep spinning, and hopefully it'll come back around to a good time again. But we do so, understand. We our, yes. The first four years of our marriage was rough. Um, we even though we grew up in the same area and went to the same school, all that jazz, um, we, were, we, from, we were from two totally different worlds. Her family very, very dysfunctional. Her dad very abusive emotionally and physically to her mom. And so she had a hard time trusting. She had a hard time believing me when I would tell her something, you know, that I would follow through with it. I came from a background where it, essentially we were, we were workaholics. And so uh, for the first four years of our marriage, and this is my, to my detriment, for the first four years of, my, of our marriage, I worked no less than 60 hours a week. Um, so I, I was basically gone all the time. And then, you know, it was, it, I, I, was, I was thinking I'm providing for that shows my love. She was thinking, where are you at? What's going on? Why are you not here? All these kind of things. So in our first four years of marriage, we definitely saw lots of opportunity for that to happen so we fully understand when when that happens and how it can happen anything you want to share else no, not on not it's recorded mm -mm. okay <laughs> maybe we'll have like a little personal thing sometime hmm those would be interesting stories all right second thing as far as relationships go uh finances that is one of the two big issues most of the time and I, I have done counseling for years and years and years y'all um, worked for for a period of time as a professional counselor also uh, on staff of churches large and small for for 20 close to 25 years now anytime anybody any couple comes for counseling you can guarantee it's going to be one of two issues that have driven them to come for help that sexual issues or finances. No, and really nothing else. There's, there might be some under other underlying things, but if they come and seek help uh, from a counselor, it's going to be one of two areas. It's going to be finances or sexual issues. Um, and so finances to me is a huge, 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 huge hurdle to jump as far as your relationship with each other, your relationship with the Lord. Because what we have is is the consumption assumption and the consumption assumption is this it is that whatever we make we feel obligated to consume how many of you uh, have ever just sat down and thought about hey I want to sit down and I want to work out a plan for my finances a percentage wise of what I'm going to live on and what I'm going to save and what I'm going to give a few of you but by and large the small percentage and that's, that's where we mess up because if we don't pick a percentage to live on in our finances, we live on the consumption assumption. that Whatever we make, we're going to spend it. And what you end up with, the percentage that you end up spending is 105%. And you end up in a financial mess. And I wish somebody had talked to us early in our marriage or before we married about that kind of stuff. I've honestly never heard a pastor really address it from the pulpit. I don't know if it's uncomfortable about, about issues like that. But here's the thing, especially for young people. If you're going to get married, come up with a percentage that you're going to live on out of what you make. Because if you don't, you're going to end up living on 105% for the first year or two. And then after that, is when that, those, all those 5% starts adding up on you. 
and, and you're going to end up with massive credit card debt. You're going to end up in a situation where you cannot buy a home. You're going to end up in a situation where you're not, you don't have any margin to live on. You can't give because everything's so tight. And, and you're just, all of a sudden, you're headed down this downward spiral that there's no, really no escape from. One of the things that we did as far as is when we first married, one of our big mistakes was, if you can believe this, was that we didn't have any, we didn't buy anything on credit. She and I married, and we both had cars that were paid off. We, we had a little money in the bank, but we couldn't buy anything because we didn't have a credit rating. It, it cost us big time when we went to buy our first home. We just, they said, you don't have a credit rating, so you can't buy anything. Uh, it's like you're kidding. I paid cash for my car. She paid cash for her car. It's all these things. So think about that, kids, as you're, as you're getting out on your own, uh, that you need to buy a few things, and it, it doesn't matter if you go the next day and pay it off. Take care of it and get your credit rating built up to where you can. Don't allow yourself to, to live on the consumption assumption because I, I have known of people that have wrecked it the other way that they had a credit rating. You went out there and got credit cards. They went out there and made loans, personal loans. They went out there and bought a new car and all these kind of things. And all of a sudden, they can't pay their bills. And, and it wrecks their credit for years and years and years. I've known of one, one particular couple that they got married uh, and both of them had some debt from previous relationships and so they brought all that with them and all of a sudden, it just absolutely wrecked their credit. They couldn't buy a home. They couldn't buy a car. They couldn't, they couldn't do anything. They couldn't go out to dinner without asking the banker if they could go. And so don't allow yourself to live on the consumption assumption. Um, one of the three good habits to work on are this. Keep track of your money. And maybe you're here, maybe you've been married, maybe your finances are all, you know, just in bad shape. Maybe these are things that you want to apply to. But number one, keep track of your money. Keep track of where it goes. Get you a ledger paper or get you a quicken on your computer and keep a track of all the things that you spend every month, and, and all of a sudden you're going to see where the leaks in your budget are. You're going to see where the areas that you need to put a guardrail as far as your finances are concerned because here's the thing, all of our margins going for that area and doing all these things. So um, the second good habit is choose a percentage of your income to live on. If you haven't done that, a few of you raise your hand that you have. And here's is the way, see, here's the thing. If you don't have a margin, you're going to spend it all. If you don't have a plan, the plan is going to work you instead of you working your plan. And so the third one is this. If you need an idea on how to handle it, do this. Get three jars <laughs> and put a, put a label on each one. One is, is, is give, one is save, and one is spend. Because here's the thing. And I'm, uh, you know, I know you're probably saying, well, I expected this part to come. The Bible has a financial plan for your life. And I'm here to tell you from living experience that if you work God's plan, it will work for you. Amen. That plan is to give. It tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 8, it says, um, it says this, Deuteronomy chapter 8, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. It's the Lord that gives ideas that are going to turn into million-dollar ideas. It's the Lord that's going to open the door for you to get education. It's going to lead to you getting a wonderful job. It's the Lord that's going to let you know the right person that's going to introduce you to the right person that's going to get your job. And, and here's the thing. So many times we read that one verse, and that's Deuteronomy 8, 18. It says, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. And we read that, and we go, oh, hallelujah, I like money. Nobody else likes money? Okay. If you don't like yours and you want to get rid of it, <laughs> see me after the, after the service. Um, but it goes on in that verse, and it says, it says it's he who gives you power to get wealth that he may confirm his covenant. Again, if we just read the first part, it's the consumption assumption that I make money for me, and it's all mine. No, it's the Lord that gives you power to get wealth so that he can confirm his covenant through you with you and through you. God's going to bless you, but God blesses you to be a blessing. And here's the thing, if we set aside a margin, this is what I'm going to give. The Bible suggests a good starting place is 10%. That's what we call a tithe. Okay? I don't know what it is. I'm, I'm here to tell you from living experience, 
We didn't always do that. When we discovered that, we found out that the 90% goes further than the 100% goes original. I, I can't explain it. It's a spiritual concept, but it's a principle that God adheres to, and his, he keeps his promises. He says this in, in, in Malachi chapter 3. He says, prove me. It's the only place in the Bible you'll find this particular phrase said by God to us. Prove me. Try me. See if I won't pour you out a blessing. There won't be room enough to contain it. And, and we didn't always do that in our Christian walk. Part of it's because we hadn't been taught. We didn't grow up in church. We didn't know anything about it. When we discovered this principle, we started try, trying to do our very, very best. And this is my suggestion because here's the, here's the pushback from everybody that doesn't give or tithe. I can't afford to. I can just barely make my bills as it is. Okay, here's, here's my challenge to you. Start somewhere. If it's, if it's at, at 2%, I'm going to give 2% of my paycheck, and I'm going to work my way up to 10%. I'll guarantee you God will meet you there. God will, will keep his promises. And, and, I mean, he's the one that says it. It's not Brother Philip. I've known person after person after person, family after family, that has taken that challenge and had told me somewhere down the line, hey, I, I, God bless me beyond compare. I've, I've shared the story with you. I actually... One time felt led to the Lord to, to preach a sermon on it. I haven't done it here yet. Uh, an entire sermon on tithing to give it. And went through all the promises that God has if we do this. And I even went to, I believe it so much. And this is what the Lord put on my heart to do then was, my challenge was start doing it. And if you can come back six months from now and show me, and tell me that you were not blessed, Show me your paycheck stubs that you were tithing and you did not get blessed. I'll sit down with the church secretary and we'll write you back out whatever you've given. Nobody came back for their money. But several people did come back. One fellow in particular, he was running a little business. And he said, he said, we, he said my wife and I were figuring out what we were going to do that week. How we were going to make it. When we were going to start filling out paperwork to declare bankruptcy on our business. And he said, I thought to myself, what have I got to lose? And he said, I started tithing that Sunday. And it was a year later when he came to me. And he said, I went from that. And he said, now I'm running three crews full time. Got more work than I can handle. Now, I'm not telling you that you can give the Lord a hand clap. I mean, it's, it, he's true to his word. Here's the thing. Blessings come in a lot of different ways. And he says, I'll pour you out a blessing. It might be that your car runs longer, your refrigerator refrigerates longer, your air conditioner conditions longer, whatever it is. God has a way of blessing us when we, when we are, uh, adhere to his promises. So give first, save second, live on the rest. And if you'll do that, all of a sudden your financial problems are kind of going away. Give first, save, live on the margin. Therefore, you have picked out a percentage to live on when you give 10%. You save whatever percent you're going to do, and then you live on the rest. All of a sudden, you have a percentage you're living on. Okay, move on. <laughs> One of the things, that, and I did want to share this. I'm trying to make it quick. I'm just getting lots of stuff to say. Uh, we have chosen to live where we're at. Okay? I've shared with you, and I'm not, take this in the, in the, in the spirit in which I'm saying it. I was a trades worker. And all those many, 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 many years ago, I was making over $25 an hour. That's been 20, right at 20 years ago. So you got to figure what it would have been like to make $25 plus an hour. It was the golden handcuffs for me. I had a call from the Lord on my life. But I was making good money. I had paid vacations. I had paid holidays. I had paid sick days. It was the hardest thing, one of the hardest decisions I ever made in my life to follow God instead of that. And I went from making that, the $25 plus an hour, plus all those benefits, free insurance, you know, paid vacations, all that stuff. This is the honest goodness. She'll, she'll tell you about it. My first ministry job was $400 dollars a month guaranteed so you can kind of do some math really really quick <laughs> and you can see that we, we certainly certainly took a big jump in in our income 
And the thing that I've seen that she's seen that she'll, she'll back up is that God has always provided. God has always met our needs, maybe not all of our wants. And that's a decision that we have made. And, you know, if you're saying, well, I can't do this, I can't give, I can't live on the margin, I can't do all these things, you can. It's just whether you want to. We, we, have, we have put ourselves in a position, we have desires just like everybody else. We'd like, she'd like to have a big home, and a couple of times in our, in our married life, she has had a, a big, nice home. And for whatever the reason, uh, the Lord has called us to do something different, and we had to move away and leave that. And so what I'm telling you is, your wants and your needs are two different things. And God says in his word, I'll meet your every need according to my riches and glory. He didn't say I'd meet your every want. Now, what I think it is, is that my wife has some blessings built up in heaven. When she gets to heaven, her mansion is going to be all that. <laughs> but what I'm telling you is that you can choose to live where you're at, or you can choose to live beyond your means. And what you have to do in order to live in this life is find that margin because, see, with, that, with no margin, if you are strapped and you're spending 105% of your income, you cannot be generous with God or anybody else. And when God speaks to your heart about sowing into a ministry or, or giving to this or tithing, all of a sudden the devil's got a stranglehold on you because of the consumption assumption. Okay? You want to add anything to that? Just That's probably the hardest thing I personally struggle with is... You know, being a woman, I you know we want a big fancy house. But anyway, I'm I'm doing this year, this moment, right now. I'm okay. <laughs> so you know, <laughs> I just you know I have to pray a lot, <laughs> pray through a lot, and just like the Apostle Paul, learn to be content in all things. That's right. So. And so you know, it's hard for her. Um, because her husband has been called into pastoral ministry, she's along for the ride on some things, and so it is. It is a. It, it has been at points in our life kind of a struggle. So what I'm telling you is, you can live on what you make, with a margin. It doesn't matter what it is. God will meet you there if you live your financial life according to His plan. Okay. And I might add, He's good to talk me down off the ledge too. <laughs> so true. <laughs> I'm the voice of reason sometimes. <laughs> All right, so the, the third area that we wanted to touch on is family issues. And again, we're not putting ourselves out there as poster children for uh, the, the, the way it's got to be. We have had our own ins and outs with, with raising children, uh, especially with Jesse. And of course, most of you know our story. But we spent eight years of our married life childless. Could not have children. Doctor said, you'll never, never have children. Forget about it. Do something else. Go, go a different avenue. So after eight years of trying to have children to no avail, we decided adoption was the route. We adopted Jesse. And my wife would have probably had children stair-stepped. We'd have had five, six kids until we got Jesse. <laughs> And uh, Jesse was a little handful uh, from the time we got him. We adopted him. He's seven and a half months old, and he was a full-time job uh, in and of himself. And so we had actually closed that chapter in our lives totally and completely. Jesse was five years old. And one fall, late fall day, and it just so happened to coincide with, with a, a move that I had made ministry-wise, that had taken away our insurance and taken away some of our income. I had made a move to a different church and was wor working my way up on staff there. And so we had just done all this. She got feeling bad one fall and just run down. She said, I'm just tired all the time and just don't understand it. And I said, Finally, go to the doctor, see what they say. She came home. She had an answer as to what was going on. And her name was Hannah. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, there was another one of those times when we had t taken a step of faith and all of a sudden uh, something that we had made a decision on, we had no insurance, all these things, and it's like, what have I done? You know, I had made this terrible, terrible decision. And it ended up actually being one of the best decisions we ever made. And, you know, the devil brought in fear about how you're going to make all your bills and all these kind of things. So 
the thing that I'm that I'm telling you there is that God God will meet you in that in your needs. But we have we have found that one of the areas that we we didn't necessarily call it guardrails, but we started out talking to our children very very young about. It wasn't necessarily under the guise of guardrails, but here's the thing you need to know about life. And here's decisions that you need to make today. We've talked to our kids about giving. We've talked to our kids about everything that, you, that we're talking about you uh, today with. And uh, so one of the things that I recommend as far as rearing children is talk to them. Talk to them, talk to them, talk to them. There's something about us that makes us uncomfortable to talk about people with sexual issues. And here's the thing. It wasn't very long in creation. God created him male and female as part of who we are. I don't know why we're so uncomfortable in talking about it. It's a taboo area. And probably some of you are uncomfortable with me talking about it in the last couple of weeks. But talk, about, talk to your kids about sexual issues. Talk to them about finances. Talk to them about all these things that we're talking to you about and don't don't give them an opportunity to have an influence from somewhere else because they're going to hear about it right. it's just the question is where are they going to hear about it are they going to hear about it from you are they going to hear about it from their friend or their friend's friend or online or in a movie or how how is their how is their outline for life going to get formed is it going to get formed in a good way with good information or is it going to get formed in a bad way with bad information so one of the things that uh, that um, I have I have personally seen, again, as I told you, uh, I've done a lot of counseling, and one one issue that we have to deal with in in church and in these days are blended families, where it's there's mine and ours. Uh, you had kids, you married somebody that had kids, y'all have got kids. And that has been, this is honest to goodness, of all the people I ever counseled with, marital counseling-wise, an easy, an easy 75% of them I would have never seen in counseling had they not had a blended family. And most of the time, the issue comes down to discipline. How are we going to discipline the kids that are yours, mine, and ours? And I even came home one day and I had a particularly rough day along that line when I was doing a lot of, a lot of counseling. And I asked her, I said, if we weren't, hadn't been married and had kids, it was your kids, my kids, our kids, would you have a problem with the way I discipline our children? She said, absolutely. And answered a question for me. And so, so many, many, many times that particular area of Raising families and child rearing and that kind of stuff causes so much conflict in a marriage. I've known of marriages that had they not had that situation, that blended family situation, they would have never had one minute of marital problems. There wasn't anything else going on. It was just all the contention and all the conflict and all the arguments and all the things that were going on and on and on about that particular issue of discipline with the children. Um, I, for those of you who don't know, Jesse's in the Army, and I just want to say there's no wonder because he was raised by a drill sergeant. <clears throat> you know, it was drop and give me 20. Look at me, look at me, boy. Stand up straight. <laughs> say, say yes, sir. That stuff all the time. And had, you know, we not been married and together forever and all this if we had been a blended family I'd have told him to hit the road with all this discipline and stuff because sometimes he was a little strict overboard in, in my opinion so anyway yes I can see where that would be a major issue And but we do in hindsight recognize that Jesse would have been a real problem had we not Definitely. had that discipline and uh, it, was, it was when I got to the point that spanking was, he was too old to spank and so we, we came up with a different plan that was push-ups. He could do 100 push-ups, easy, just like that. When he joined the Army, he set records <laughs> as far as the number of push-ups. <laughs> I even told him one time when he was about 15, I said, boy, right now you hate me, but someday you're going to thank me for this because, he, boy, upper body strength, he had it and still does. I think he got to do a few push-ups and basic training, too. Uh, fact is that whenever I, we went to watch him graduate, uh, introduced myself to the drill sergeant, 
And I said, I'm Jesse Reed's father. And he said, oh, he said, little Reed likes to talk. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, definitely, definitely. And every child's different, uh, you know, and knock on wood, we've, Hannah's been a different story as far as discipline issues. Um, we could talk to her and reason with her. And Jesse, there wasn't a lot of reasoning going on. Yeah, I knocked on wood. <laughs> so. Anyway, I know that this has been totally different. Last week, this week has been totally different. But we j I just felt like we needed to share some things from our heart and kind of maybe there somebody had questions about it. So if it was good, I'm glad. If it wasn't good, just uh, <laughs> next week will be different. <laughs> so we talked about a lot of different things, talked about relationships, talked about finances, talked about child rearing and all those kind of things. If there's anybody that has any questions, uh, we'll be glad to talk to you afterward. Please, 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 if you can hang out and help us fill the, the, the to-go boxes for the, for the Feet on the Street um, meals today, we appreciate that so very, very much. But before we go, I just want everybody to bow your heads, close your eyes just for a minute. And I realize it's been a little different service today, but you know what? I've realized through the years that God works through a lot of different things. And maybe you're here this morning, and maybe... Maybe you're sitting next to your wife or your husband. Or maybe you're sitting here alone because they wouldn't come. But right now you're saying, God, I, I need your help. In my family, I need your help in my finances. I need your help in my, with raising my children. And you know what? So many times we are so hesitant to ask for help in those areas. But there's nobody looking around. I just simply want to pray with you. If that's you today and you say, God, I need help in one of these areas, just slip your hand up where I can pray with you right now. Yes, 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 yes. Hands all over the building. Maybe you're sitting here and maybe you're saying, hey, Brother Philip, I, I don't know God like you're talking about knowing him. He's not a part of my everyday. Maybe I, maybe I just kind of come to church, smooth things over with him for another week. But I want to know him like you're talking about knowing him. I want to make things right with God today. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up where I can pray with you? Yes, yes. I'm not going to embarrass you. not going to call your name. not going to call you up front. Anybody else? Very quickly, just raise your hand. We're going to pray about that first. You raised your hand and said, I want to make things right with God. Then here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray this, but I want every born-again believer to pray it with them just as a show of your support for the decision they're making. And just say this, Heavenly Father, I ask you today, come into my life, come into my heart. I need you. Would you please forgive me for all those things that would separate us? Lord Jesus, I accept what you did on that cross for me. You died in my place. You died for my sin so that I could be with you in heaven one day but while I'm here on this earth lead me guide me direct me fill me with your Holy Spirit and I thank you for loving me and saving me in Jesus name amen amen give the Lord a big hand clap for that this morning lots and lots of hands went up God I need your help so I'm just going to agree with you. You know specifically what you need to pray about. But that prayer of agreement changes things. So let's agree together. Father, we all need your help. It might not be in the same areas. It might not even be something that we mentioned today. But dear Lord, help us. You know our weaknesses. In Psalm 103 on, on, that we read earlier, on down in that, in that psalm, it says that you remember that we're dust. And Lord, you remember that we're frail. You remember that we're made imperfect. And so, God, I know that if we ask you just to forgive us for those areas where we have fallen short, and God, that you will come in and help us. Meet us where we're at today. Strengthen us. Give us the resolve to change things, to change our minds, to change our life because of you. And dear Lord, that you'd help us in all these areas. God, I pray for our families. I pray for our marriages. I pray for our homes, dear God, that you would make that a sanctuary 
that you'd make it a place that you would always be found. We bind the enemy from coming in and causing, causing havoc and, and, and chaos in our homes, in our marriages, in our relationships. And Lord, right now we just speak wellness, healing, and peace into every relationship in this church. And God, that you'd just do some awesome things. Show us the path to take, and we're going to take it. Illuminate it. God, make it very, very clear in our minds what we're supposed to do what part we're supposed to play in that. But God, I'm looking forward to the great things you're going to do because I know that is your plan and you're all for it. So Lord, we thank you in advance for doing those great things. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Give the Lord another.